Um, so let's go ahead and bring our hearts to uh, the attention of, of the Lord this morning, and uh, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord of glory, we thank you, firstly, for all that you've done. Lord, as we look and long um, in this season toward Christmas about how Jesus came into this world as a baby, how the Son of God took on flesh for us, Lord, we, we look to that because it's so important for us to know and to understand. And so as we read about that today, as we learn about that today, Lord, prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for what you have for us, Lord, in this time and in this season. Fill us with joy today, Lord. Let us glorify you and lift those praises up to you through sacrificial living, Lord, that our lives would be lives of just worship and praise in everything that we do. Speak through me, Lord, your truths, the gospel, Lord, of what you would have me say today. Help me get out of the way, Lord, and let your word be clearly on display this morning. You know that we've come in here with burdens and struggles and trials, but let all of those be left at the door and let us be filled with peace as we sit at the foot of the cross this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we are, yes, again, are doing our, our first Christmas message, so we're going to be in the book of Luke. So if you want to get that prepared, we'll be in Luke chapter 2, and we'll be going through verses 8 through 20. Now, since we're in the Christmas spirit, did any of you get a chance to read the sign outside? It says, Christians are like Christmas trees. You're either live or artificial. And I thought that was important to recognize that it's, it's very true in a lot of sense. It's, it's funny, but it's also convicting because we have to think about ourselves. Oh, I don't want to be a fake Christian. Um, so just something for you to think about too this morning as we get in the Christmas spirit because that's what it's about. But today's sermon, I've entitled it the greatest joy ever known. And the purpose of this sermon is to share with you why what, or what I believe to be the greatest source of joy in the entire world. And my hope is that all of our fears, all of our worries and troubles would be replaced with joy as we hear about what God has done for all humankind. Now, the central truth of Scripture and of this passage that we will be reading is that, you know, we hear about Christmas and, and, and its joy is one of the key topics in that, Christmas joy. But sometimes we are filled with this wrong sense of joy. It, it comes from the wrong reasons. But the Bible tells us that ultimate joy can be found in the person of Christ, which is what Christmas ultimately is all about. So now I ask you this morning, when was the last time that you felt great joy? Perhaps it was at a wedding. Or maybe you got a new job that was really exciting. Or maybe it was the birth of a child. And for me, it was the birth of my daughter, Bryn. You can put that picture up there. So I just want to paint this picture for you. I, if you're a parent, you know this, but the day you find out the next nine months are very grueling, not only for your partner, but you yourself, you're constantly worrying, trying to make sure they're okay, that nothing's wrong, that there's no issues. You're just hoping that they're not born with a tail or something crazy, <laughs> and, and you're stressed, and you're worried. But I tell you, in that moment, when it was all said and done, and I held her for the first time, it was nothing but joy, just complete, pure joy because all the hard stuff was over I can see her and she's okay and it's just pure joy and so maybe you again are thinking about those moments that have brought you great joy now the challenge is is that this world offers us such great blessings like that but I think God wants us to look for something even greater than this I mean could there even be something greater than that well God says that there is so today we will look at another story about the birth of a baby that brought the greatest joy, the highest joy, to all humanity. 
So let us go ahead and turn to the text of Luke 2. I want to briefly paraphrase verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to read them verbatim. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. The context of this story, it's a historical account. And it talks about how Caesar Augustus is having this registration for people uh, so that they can be registered for the census, so they can pay their taxes and all those various things. And these things are real. You can go back and, and look them up. Now, Luke, some say that there's some complication with learning about the history of it and the actual timing of it. So if you like to do in-depth Bible study, you might see some of that. But the main point is it, it doesn't take away ultimately from what God is trying to communicate. And that is, in the Old Testament, there was a prediction that the Messiah, that the Christ would be born in the town of Bethlehem. And that's what we find here. That's where Mary and Joseph find themselves. And God uses rulers in that time, Caesar Augustus, he uses small, lowly people to bring Mary and Joseph to where they're supposed to be. And that's where it concludes in verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there is no place for them in the end. So what I'm going to do is I think the best way to grasp and understand this message today is I want to go ahead and just read through the passage. Together, we'll read through it. I'll explain it a little bit here and there, and then I want to go back to several questions that I want to ask all of us here this morning. So let's just go ahead and read through it. So the baby's been born. They're in Bethlehem. They're exactly where they're supposed to be. Now enters verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So what we have happening here, is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And that is what this story is saying and displaying, that God, in verse 8, he chooses to reveal this long-awaited message to a bunch of shepherds. Now, it's important to know in history's time period, they're at a very low point in their history. They're not in the promised land. They've been scattered and exiled Some of them are probably feeling quite hopeless at times. And you would think that God would choose to reveal the announcement of this coming king to someone like Caesar Augustus so that he could go and tell everybody. But he tells the lowliest people. You see, in the Old Testament, being a shepherd was actually an honorable position. For David, the king, it was a family business. But at this point in time, shepherds were associated with with lowly people. They were considered thieves. They weren't allowed to testify in courts because no one trusted them, whether they stole other people's land or other people's flocks. These, all these various things, and one of the biggest ones is that being a shepherd caused you to be ceremonially unclean because you're around all these animals, you're doing all these things. But God considers himself a shepherd. Jesus considers himself the good shepherd, and so he chooses to reveal himself to these faithful shepherds this night. 
And he tells them this good news of great joy. So, so what is this good news? What is this greatest joy that I'm talking about? Well, it comes from verse 10 and 11. So again, you have these shepherds. They're out keeping watch by night. And then all of a sudden, an angel appears and the glory of the Lord surrounds them and they're terrified. And that was the common response when the Shekinah glory of God entered a place was to be fearful because you're encountering something so holy and in that moment you realize how small and unholy you are. And that's what the shepherds are experiencing. They very much think that they're about to die. But then they're met quickly with comforting words. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So what is that? It's that today in the city of Bethlehem, there is a Savior that was born who is Christ the Lord. So that brings me to the first question that I want to ask us today. Why would the birth of a baby bring great joy? Well, first and foremost, as I've said many times already, Israel was expecting the Messiah to come. They were waiting for him, but they were expecting him to come in great power, military power. They were looking to be delivered physically from their enemies. And so he's finally here, the Christ, the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. He is the Savior both physically as well as spiritually for all of their needs. And you know, these shepherds knew that best because where they were located in Jerusalem between Bethlehem and this open field, it is very likely that the particular flock they watched over, these were the sheep and the lambs that were used for sacrifice. And so they understood their deep need for a Savior. They understood what it meant. And so when they hear that the Savior is here, you better believe that they're filled with great joy. So he is the Savior of Israel. But not only that, what does it say? It will be good news for all the people. So yes, absolutely all of Israel. But now all people, Gentiles, every race, every tribe, every tongue. Jesus is their Savior. See, what does it say? It says, unto you. Unto you. Individual, you. He is your Savior, and he has been born. Not only that, he is the Savior that has been born, but he is Christ the Lord, meaning he is God. He is God himself, and as Matthew sang so beautifully, what king like this would step down from his throne? Who is this man that has done this? He took on human flesh. And sometimes we may not fully understand the implications of what that means. But the fact that Jesus took on flesh means that we can call him a friend. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Because he bridges that gap now. You see, again, Israel knew their sinfulness. They knew that the judgment of God was against themselves. So they knew they needed a Savior. But we ourselves may not always understand why we need a Savior. But because Christ became a human. You see, everything he did, everything we go through, you know, we sometimes say, I've heard people say so many times, like, nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody feels the way that I feel. But we have a Savior who does, who in every possible way was tempted and experienced all of life the way that we have experienced it. Not only was he mocked and abused and scorned and beaten and outcast and everything else, he knows how you feel. Because again, he reveals himself to the lowliest of, of people, but he's also here for the lowliest of people. He doesn't come for the powerful or the prestigious, but he comes for those who are lowly in heart. And so by him taking on flesh, we can relate to him. And he can pardon our sins because he is God and because he has endured it himself. Now, another reason why this brings great joy is because all of this, ultimately what happens is Christ brings peace between God and man by the forgiveness of sins. 
That's ultimately what happens. When we say he's the Savior, that's why he's the Savior, because he can forgive sins. He has the power to do that. And again, Israel knows and Israel understands this. It doesn't need to be explained to them. But for us, that's where the rest of the New Testament comes from, is Jesus proclaiming his message to repent and believe. And Jesus has the power to do that. Now, secondly, we've heard about this great joy. I think we understand what it is, that there is a Savior that has been born, and that he is important, that he is the Son of God, and he is here. He's everything we've been looking for, everything we've been needing and wanting and desiring, and all of this should bring us such joy and understanding. But now, why do I specifically, though, me, consider this to be the greatest joy ever known? So I want to share about myself a little bit. Um, The reason why I consider this to be the greatest joy that I've ever personally experienced is because of who I was before. You see, I wasn't a Jew, and I wasn't brought up with that understanding of sacrifice and atonement and of all those different things, but I understood that there was this sense of morality inside me. There was this sense of I knew what was right and I knew what was wrong, and we all have that because we're made in the image of God. He has put his law upon our hearts, and so for me, I was sensitive to who I was as a person. And prior to being born again, to becoming a Christian, I was bad. I was an evil person. I was wretched. The problem was, though, is that I knew I was. You see, it's one thing to be an evil person, but it's another thing to be evil and to know you're evil because it brings such turmoil within yourself. And that's who I was. I knew I wasn't worth anything. I believe that about myself, that I did not deserve anything, especially the grace of God. I hated myself, greatly depressed, and bondaged and enslaved to sin. A horrible condition. But when you tell me that there was a Savior born, who is Christ the Lord, And he says, Ben, you can be set free of all of this. It's yours. I don't look at you as lowly. I look at you as my son. You are precious in my eyes. And this joy that he has given me, yes, I know I'm intense and and, and emotional, but it's because there's so much joy in my heart that I want you to know about. And see, this joy, it's a permanent joy. It hasn't left me since the day I received it. And not only that, but what, does, what, what, what happened when the shepherds experienced this, this great power? They were afraid. But again, immediately their fear was brought with joy. And so this joy that we get to have and experience, it removes fear. Are you fearful of what the future holds? Are you concerned about where you are or where you're going or what you not are yet or what you are not yet? Are you worried about that? Fear not, because there is good news that brings great joy. That is for all people, and it is that Christ the Lord was born and became a human. And not only this, but you see, that's, that's, that's where I was. I was, uh, I felt so much condemnation, so much guilt upon myself. I knew I knew that I deserved hell and that I should be sent there immediately. But now Christ says, no. You can come and you can sit at my table. You can approach God with all of your needs, all of your worries, all of your struggles, everything. You can come as you are because my righteousness is yours. So the reason that this is the greatest joy that you will ever know is because, again, it's permanent, and it goes beyond this life. See, all those things I mentioned in the beginning, they're all good. They're all wonderful, but they pass away. But this joy that comes with knowing Christ goes beyond this life. And then, lastly, I am no longer 
Praise God, I am no longer a slave to sin. Do you know what that feels like? To be bound to something for so long? It just follows you everywhere you go, literally like a ball and shackle wherever you go, always reminding you, Ben, you're not good enough. Ben, you'll never be what you want to be. But to have that removed, no longer holding you down, that brings great joy. So that's why I consider this to be the greatest joy ever known. And I hope that you see that, that through this babe that was born, he brings great joy because he sets you free, because he offers forgiveness and redemption and all of these beautiful and wonderful things. It's like you can't make this up. No human could, could conjure this up because all humans want to be is great. But Jesus said, no, I will let go of my greatness so that I could become like them and redeem them. Now, most importantly, I think, I think you understand why this is so great. I think you get what I'm trying to say and, and trying to explain, but now the question is, how can you experience this great joy? How can you have it for yourself? Well, I think the perfect example is given by looking at what the shepherds have done. The shepherds are the perfect example of what it looks like to come to faith. So let's go back. What was their response? After hearing this news, what did they do? Did they, you know, <laughs> I just think if it were us, like, I don't know, we, we'd pull our phones out and like start recording this moment and then just share it on the internet and just go about our day. But, but what, what is it that they do? So they hear this proclamation. They hear this good news. And their first response is in faith. It says, they, they're told this will be your sign. In verse 12, you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then verse 15, the angels went away. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. They didn't say, should we do this? Should we go over there? Or should we just tend to our sheep, make sure they're okay? No, they had a response of faith and they believed. And so for you, if you want to experience this joy, this joy that makes a man come up here and cries in front of people. If you want that kind of joy, it, 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 it really sounds foolish at times what we do and this message that we have, but it does bring me joy. I, I want you to, to know that. I, I'm a quite serious person, and uh, I know that I could smile more and do these things differently, but I am what I am by the grace of God, but I want you to know that there is joy that exudes inside of me that... that I mean, I wish I could be like my daughter. Um, <laughs> I wish I could just be like a two-year-old, you know. This, this past week, we, uh, we got the great privilege of uh, going to the Polar Express train ride um, and at the train museum, and we were able to participate in that. And I just remember the kids were so happy, so excited, but just Bryn, when the music's playing, she's just like, she's just into it, and she's having so much fun. And like that's, that's the joy that we can have in the Lord. And some of us have to grow more in that. Some of us might have to be more intentional to do that. But again, I, want, I just want you to know that there's joy in the Lord and that I have it. I'm trying to show you I have it today. But um, let's get back to what I'm trying to say here, how you can have it. So here's how you can have it. Be like the shepherds and respond in faith by seeking Christ. Because that's what they did, yes? They heard this news, and then they went. Now they got to physically go and see the Christ before they died. Now we may not be able to physically see him, but I assure you he is here today. And you, you must go, and you have to seek him. Jesus says, knock at the door, and it will be opened to you. Seek, and you will find. But you have to do it. I can try and force you and take your hand and knock on it, but... I can't keep you there. You have to do it. And that's what the shepherds had to do. They had to respond. Now, how also did they respond? It says in verse 16, 
they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. So what I encourage you today is don't wait until tomorrow. Imagine what the shepherds would have missed if they said, we'll go in the morning. They would have missed out on seeing the Christ and knowing the joy that comes with that. So don't wait until tomorrow. For you do not know what today will bring. You do not know what tomorrow will, will bring. Life is short. And again, it's, it's not a threat. I'm not threatening you. <laughs> but in a very real sense, Christ has come once into the world with grace and redemption. But he will come again in glory and power and judgment. And we do not know when that day is. So please, make haste. Thirdly, as we continue to read, verse 17, so the shepherds made it, and they say this, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. So for you here today, if you want to experience this great joy that comes with knowing Jesus, don't just simply wonder all of your life. See, when they heard, the people there heard this, they, they wondered, they fantasized about, could this be true? Is this real? Is what the shepherds are saying factual? With wonder, there comes a sense of doubt. I wonder if so-and-so likes me or not. I wonder if I'll get that job. You see, this idea of wondering, it's not taking root in anything. It's just a hope, a, a faulty hope when we wonder about something. But what is the alternative to be like Mary, who did what? She treasured these things in her heart. There's a real difference between wondering in the mind and storing and believing in your heart. So are you just wondering today? Is what this man's saying true? Can I really have this? Or do you believe it and you store it in your heart, saving it for later? So don't just wonder, but store this truth today in your heart. Now, lastly, verse 18, or verse, nine, uh, verse 20. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, lastly, if you have responded by faith and you seek Christ and you find him, and you're no longer just wondering, but you believe it. By nature, you will live your life glorifying and praising God. That is the result. That is the effect of knowing what this joy is. So if you don't know or haven't felt this joy, I'm not pronouncing any type of judgment. I'm not saying you're any type of thing. But all I do here today is just proclaim the gospel and ask you to examine your heart of where you're at. Is your life that modeled by praise? Or is it just modeled by wonder and facts and statements and all these types of things? But be like the shepherds who believed and sought it out for themselves and took hold of it. And then they went back into the common world and did their common things because they were just common people like all of us here. And in their daily jobs, whether it was shepherding are working at Starbucks or you're a janitor or whatever it is you do, in that place, worship and glorify God. And in doing so, you also will experience joy. I mean, who, who can be sad when you're saying glory to God in the highest? You can't, it's just not possible. Unless it's tears of joy, that is. So that's what I have for you today. That a little over 2,000 years ago, this baby was born into the world and he is Christ the Lord and now today you have an opportunity to respond today do you leave here wondering or do you live, leave here treasuring up all these things in your heart and now if you want to experience that joy 
You need to seek the Lord Jesus. You need to find him and make him your own. And he's there. Just knock. And if you need help doing that, like Ben, I, I hear what you're saying, but I really just don't understand it, and I'm just nervous to proceed, well then, I'll sit with you, however long it takes. Email me, email Mark, write us a letter, stay after church, because this is important. There's a reason why this message of joy is still being proclaimed 2,000 years ago, or 2,000 years to today, because it's important, it's real. So what are you going to do today? I hope, I hope <laughs> that you will choose joy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your glory. Thank you for your joy. <laughs> thank you for helping uh, a poor, wretched sinner like me do something impossible uh, because I need you, Lord, even in the midst of all of this. And these people need you, Lord. And I pray that today you would fill them with joy. Lord, that they would no longer be filled with wondering, but they would be filled with belief, Lord. Earnest belief to seek out Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son of God born on high that we can be friends with, that we can know intimately. I pray, Lord, that you help us do that, that you, Lord, would guide us and direct us in that. As we go, Lord, uh, let us leave glorifying and praising you as we go about our day. And just help us, Lord. If anybody in here, Lord, feels that tug on their heart, I pray that they would make haste, Lord, to seeking you today, that you, Father, would have your will be done, and that we would just continue to proclaim this Jesus, Lord, who suffered and died for us, who became like us, and now we can call him a brother, Lord. Thank, thank you for that gift. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.